Jay Shetty is a former monk and motivational speaker who was followed by over 20 million people. He went from being bullied as a child for being overweight and nerdy to living as a monk across India and Europe and becoming one of the internet's biggest celebrities. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. It's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, stand out. We're being built for a job or we're being built to be in a box. Right. We're being built so that we fit into society. And I find it funny, right? It's like when you're a kid, you're told to fit in. Like what do you, you probably remember this, stay in line, yeah. like fit in, yeah. everyone has to wear a uniform, everyone dresses the same, everyone has to do this. And then when you grow older, what are we all trying to do? We're all trying to stand out. It's weird. It's like your whole life you were told to fit in and then as soon as you grow older, it's like, oh, you need a personal brand now, you need to stand out. Like, do you know your own <laughs> voice? You need to stand out. Because we realize that we're all different. Rule number two, strengthen your convictions. How do you deal with it when the doubt is coming from the people that you really love and you know they care about you? Yeah, it was hard. I didn't go to my, gradu I graduated but never went to my graduation ceremony. So my mom doesn't have a picture of me holding my degree and that was a big thing for her yeah. because I moved to India, I just went. So I never went to that and that was a big thing for her. And actually my parents, I'm very grateful. My mom and dad are actually fairly liberal and supportive of anything I've decided to do. It's my extended family that's had more opinions yeah. and been more involved in kind of stirring stuff up with my parents, if that makes sense. So the way I dealt with it was always asking myself these questions around, you know, is someone invested in my future? Is someone gonna be there for me when I'm struggling? And is someone paying my bills? Like those are my three checking system of who matters in life. Like your soul, your mind, and your paycheck. And I think the biggest thing I asked myself was just, am I gonna look back, on, if I don't do this, am I gonna look back, going back to the Alexander the Great story, am I gonna look back on my deathbed and say, my mom and dad held me back? Because I may say I'm gonna do it for them, I'm not gonna do this decision because I respect them and love them, but am I gonna hate them in the end or be bitter towards them or feel a negative feeling towards them because I feel they held me back? And if that's the truth, I never wanna feel that about my parents, they're incredible. So I need to go and take the responsibility to make this shift. And I think the truth is that when we think people are holding us back, it's just us not taking responsibility for us to push forward. Like that's all it is. Because the truth is, if you really, 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 really want something, right? Like if someone told you right now, you had to get on a plane and there was a million dollars in New York, no one would say, oh, my parents can't afford a plane. Like no one would say that, you would, no. you would do it. If you really wanted it, you'd get on a plane right now and you'd go pick that million dollars up. So it's our own insecurity that we reflect onto the people around us. And I think it's really important. I, I get it, there are people who are toxic around us. I get it, I had that too. There were people who were just like, Literally people said to me like, you realize you're gonna fail at being a monk. You realize when you come back, no one's gonna hire you. You realize when you come back, no one's gonna wanna be with you. You realize, you know, there were so many things like people like, you know, you're gonna be socially dead. Like no one's gonna care where you are. There was so much of that, but it didn't get amplified because I was strong in my conviction. So the way I dealt with it was just keep strengthening your conviction rather than trying to weaken the argument because the, the, the opinions of others will get weakened when you strengthen your own, right? That's how it works. You don't weaken someone else's to strengthen your own. Rule number three, avoid instant judgment. So we're so used to in our life having instant judgment, defining a moment and giving it a label, good or bad, in the moment. And I thought, how do I present a concept to the world 
where we can laugh at ourselves and realize that sometimes our instant judgment or our instant labeling processor isn't always correct. Yes. How do we, how do we get that? So this script or narrative that I shared in this video is around a gentleman who goes to buy these cookies because he feels like having a few cookies because his flight's delayed and he sits down to eat these cookies and the gentleman opposite him where you're sitting right now starts to take cookies out as well. <laughs> And he's thinking, how's this guy? And the guy looks a little rugged. He looks a little scruffy. He doesn't look put together. So naturally, all of our biases, our unconscious biases start coming up and stemming up. And we start thinking, oh, he looks a little shady. <laughs> or maybe he doesn't have money. That's why he's taking my cookies. And we have this impression of I, me, and mine. These are my cookies. How can he take them? Only to realize when he leaves that your cookie box was in your bag. And that gentleman was sharing his cookies with you. And then this person has this epiphany or this moment of realizing how quick he was to judge, but how wrong he was. And I think all of us in different ways have different moments in our life where whether we misjudged a person the first time we met them, or we misjudged someone because of the first thing they said to us, or we had a friend that now is our best friend, but our first impression was, oh, they're a loser. And all of a sudden now we think they're amazing. Rule number four, have self-awareness. Emotional intelligence to me is being able to be aware of yourself, self-awareness, being able to know yourself. That's the highest form of EQ. Right. Like being able to say, I know when I'm at my best, I know when I struggle, and I know when this is a limiting belief or not. And then being able to process all of that. So we're not helping people, we are, I, I love saying this because it, it simplifies it, but we teach people what to think, not how to think. Right. We tell them two plus two is four, but we don't tell them how to think about a problem. And that's why when you're faced with a new problem and you don't have a formula for it and you don't have an equation for it, right. you're like, oh, I'm stuck, right? And, and life's like that. Like when in life have you used a formula to solve a real situation oh, in life, even it. business? Yeah. Like when has a formula helped you? Yeah. But we're taught that formulas solve equations. But we all know that there's no formula to business, success, happiness, meaning, etc., etc., etc. Also, if you want to have more confidence, self-love, and motivation, check out my 254 series where every day for the next 254 days, I'll send you an unlisted video to your email that is fire and amazing. It's 100% free as well. The links to join are in the description below. Because being a really, really good listener is one of the most underrated secrets to success. So I started to study myself. I found most people don't know who they are. They really don't. You can outwork anybody, mm -hmm. no matter how badass they are. Rule number five, filter feedback. I literally <clears throat> skip over negative comments. Genuinely, since day one, and I remember reading at the start, and so I'll, I'll add this. There have been times when I've looked at negative comments and been like, oh, that's quite funny. Like, you know, it's oh, they're yeah. funny, they're true. But overall, I try to respond to everyone who said something positive, and I rarely put any energy into put anyone who put anything negative because I don't want to change their mind. They're entitled to their belief. They're okay to feel that way. And if I feel like it's good feedback, I'll take it on board. But if I feel like it's just someone being a keyboard warrior and you know, doesn't like me and saying what they want, then I'm not gonna take that seriously. Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. 100%. If there's some authenticity and truth behind it, it's a much different comment than just unabashed hate. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had everything from he has a wind machine in his videos to make sure his <laughs> hair flies, right? Like I've had that, that angle. And I'm Wait, like, you don't have I a wind don't. machine? I don't. I just went out on a really windy day. <laughs> this is an exclusive is, on the yeah, podcast. This is an exclusive <laughs> on the podcast. I do not have a wind machine. Uh, but I've had everything from that. And I laughed at that. I thought that was a hilarious comment. Through to the other side of just like, you know, I don't agree with you and I don't agree with the point you're making. This is my point. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I had three minutes to explain that. And I missed that point. Like, you're right. You know, I agree with you. If I, if I had a podcast like this, I could have explained myself. So, you know, I, but I do think that we do drag our own selves down. We put all the energy into the negativity and amplify it. Rule number six, balance your ego. Another story I'll tell you because I love this too and it shows so, and, and he'll like this story. So Marcus Aurelius, if you haven't read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, highly recommend it. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor Meditations is his personal journal. And one of the stories that I love about him that, that comes up in a few Hollywood movies too is that once when he was walk, walking through the Roman town square, he used to have his advisor follow him around. And whenever people would glorify him and praise him, the person's job was to come into his ear and whisper, you're just a man, you're just a man. Just to oh, remind wow. him, just to remind him in that moment where you just, 
you know, in that moment where you just feel like your ego is just going through the roof because everyone's saying, you're amazing, you changed my life, etc. A, to remember you're just a man, and I would add to that, remember the people who made you that, right? Wow. Remember the people who gave you that. And so that's how I've learned to balance ego is by any time I'm glorified or praised or appreciated or recognized, I'm passing that off to my teachers, guides, mentors, the universe, and accepting it on their behalf. So if I receive an award, I actually don't think it's mine. I'm accepting it on behalf of everyone who made me the way I am. It's beautiful. Whether it was positive or negative too. Rule number seven, read old books. One of my favorite thoughts from Martin Luther King is, if you want a new idea, read an old book. What old books? <laughs> uh, many different ones. The Bhagavad Gita is probably one of my favorite books. It's, it's been such a huge part of my personal journey and personal life. Uh, many other religious texts as well. So the Bible has been a big part of my study. Spent a lot of time with the Bible. And, and then it can just be thoughts and ideas, even of the last 2000 years. So Stoicism, a huge fan of Marcus Aurelius meditations. That's been a huge book for me that I've studied. And sometimes old can just mean 50 years or 100 years ago too. Mm. But those are some of the bigger ideas that I think have had more prominent effects in my life. So Vedic and Stoic knowledge has probably been the most influential. Rule number eight, focus on yourself. After a long time, the other day, my friends and I went bowling. And I started to think to myself, that life is a lot like bowling. Bowling is a team sport just like life. In bowling, sometimes the best players struggle and others that were less likely to do well surprise you and make all the difference. This is one of my favorite lessons. Focusing on someone else's score doesn't make yours any better. It's easy to get distracted by how well someone else is playing. You see their score go up, they bowl a strike or a spare, you're calculating in your mind what you think that could be. But all that does is it distracts you from your game. Similarly, in life, focusing on someone else's Instagram grid doesn't make yours any better. Focusing on what someone else is doing for work or what they're driving doesn't make yours any better. Focus on yourself, focus on your own role, your strengths, that will make all the difference. Rule number nine, have no expectations. I'm able to not judge myself because I don't judge others. A lot of people who powerful. are like, a lot of, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me, I don't know, That's I'm so just- so powerful. No, I love about, that, that's okay. such a great point. How do you think that's about that? That's such a great point. No, you're, you're spot on because the reason why we have, we judge others is because we judge ourselves, right? The opposite of what you're saying. And so for me, it's the same thing. The reason why I don't expect is because I see everything as my responsibility. Yep. I see everything as my work. Yes. And I see everything else as a bonus. Yes. Like it's just amazing that anyone even cares about me or has time for me or makes an effort to do something or connect me to someone mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And that's just a beautiful bonus of life. But I've got to be in charge of it. And I think that just came from many years of having expectations. I think that came from times when I did expect and I didn't get, and I realized I don't want to feel this way anymore. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is aim for 75%. I always talk about there's two types of create, well, there's three types of creators, but we usually end up one or the two. So there's the sellout creator. A sellout creator only goes with what the audience wants. So you literally forget about anything you care about or believe in, you just go for what you think is going to get likes. And then the opposite is the selfish creator who only creates for themselves. They're like, I think this is amazing. Like <laughs> I'm the funniest person in the world or I'm the deepest person or whatever it is. And you create something and like no one wants to watch it because you literally made it for you and your mom. Like, you know, it's kind of like sits there. And so I always aim for being in the middle. I recognize that I want to stand for what I believe in, but I also want it to connect and resonate and have a positive impact on other people's lives. So that's my starting point, that every piece of content should be true to me, but it should resonate with people. It should make a difference. I set a goal very early on that my videos were only 75% complete. And I say this everywhere. Actually, I've never said it often on, I've never said it on a podcast, but I've said it often in, on stage and at events. My videos are only 75% complete, which means, I mess words up often. So you'll see that sometimes my sentence wasn't perfect. I mispronounced a word. I developed a lisp on a word because it was in flow and I said it and it wasn't right, but it felt right. And other things where I finished a shoot and we forgot a shot that was huge for the video, 
But I'm like, it's all right, 75%. So my goal with every video is 75%. And I've had to do that because I've realized that if I wait for 75 to 99, I'll be waiting for a year oh. and a half or three years. Like, two videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have two videos, right? And we release three videos a week right now. And so for me, the goal was always 75%. And I personally- I love think, that. Yeah, and I personally think that's a great aim because 75% yeah. is realistic, it's quality. So you're not settling for less, but 75 to 99 is such a long journey. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, if you're still here watching, I wanna celebrate you. If you commit to taking action after watching this video, we don't just watch videos, we do something about it. Give me a hashtag believe down in the comments as well. I really started to get fascinated in my teens. My father became very spiritual when I was 10 years old and I actually saw that as very weird because- Why did he do that? I think he went through, now when I look back on hindsight, he went through his sort of like midlife crisis journey search at the age of 40 where mm. he was married, had two kids, had a decent job in the city, but didn't feel satisfied and didn't feel fulfilled. And so he went off and I was 10 years old. He went on in his search. So he went from everything from Reiki and healing to Church of Scientology through to all the religious truths and was just searching for answers. And when he did that, that was actually quite alien and weird for me and my family because we thought, oh, he's just gone mad. Because I guess it was my first experience of what a midlife crisis or midlife journey looks like. So that actually deterred me from spirituality because it was almost like, he was letting the family down and it was tough for my mom and all the rest of it. So that was, that was kind of how my teens were spent. But then I got fascinated by it because I remember it was one Christmas and we used to celebrate Christmas every year. We used to wrap presents, have a Christmas tree. And one year I just felt like a hypocrite. I was just like, I don't know anything about Jesus. And I don't know much about Christianity. I was about 15 years old. And I was like, but we celebrate Christmas. Mm. Like, why do we celebrate Christmas? So then I started, I, st I remember I went to church that year uh, on Christmas Day and Christmas Eve just because I felt like a hypocrite and I felt that I should at least understand or try and take an interest in what I was doing. If you want another amazing video highlighting excellence in the Indian community, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.